Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this talk, New York Between Art and Life, The Task of the Critic, co-presented with Judd Foundation. The exhibition that inspired this conversation, New York 1962 to 1964, explores a pivotal three-year period in the history of art and culture in New York City. During these years, the Jewish Museum's then director, Alan Solomon, transformed the museum into one of the most important venues for the exhibition of contemporary art. Emerging in this context, a generation of painters, sculptors, dancers, and poets rose to prominence, incorporating material directly from their urban surroundings and producing works that were as rich and complex as the city itself. New York, 1962 to 1964, is on view at the Jewish Museum through January 8th, 2023. We encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. I would like to thank Judd Foundation for working with us to conceive and present this panel. It is my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Murray, Director of Archives and Programs, to share a little bit more information and introduce the speakers. Thanks, Jenna. I'm Caitlin Murray, the Director of Archives and Programs for Judd Foundation. Thank you to Jenna and to the staff of the Jewish Museum for their work on the exhibition and for organizing this conversation. The time of 1962 to 1964 is a particularly rich period in the development of Donald Judd's work. It's a time when he moved from painting to working in three dimensions. It's also in a period in which he wrote monthly reviews of shows and exhibitions in New York, beginning in fall 1959 and continuing until the beginning of 1965, after which he no longer worked as a critic for hire. In addition to the many artists included in the exhibition, whose work Judd reviewed as a critic, his connections to the period of New York 1962, 1964, can be seen in the works he installed at his home and studio, 101 Spring Street in New York. At 101 Spring Street, he installed works made at this time by Dan Flavin, Frank Stella, and Klaus Oldenburg. We invite you all to visit 101 Spring Street, which is open for regular guided visits. It's a pleasure to be with our four speakers today to reflect on Judd's criticism, their own practice as writers, and the changing role of and venues for art writing. The moderator of today's conversation is Sarah C. Bancroft, art historian, curator, and executive director of the James Rosenquist Foundation. Laban Judd, artistic director of Judd Foundation and the son of Donald Judd. Johanna Fateman, writer, art critic, musician, and owner of Seagull Salon in New York and Wayne Kostenbaum, poet, critic, fiction writer, and artist. I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Jenna and Caitlin, I'm delighted to join you today and would like to welcome our viewers to this panel as well as our panelists, Flavin, Joanna, and Wayne. The first half of the program will entail presentations from Flavin, Joanna, and Wayne, and in the second half, we'll have a roundtable discussion together. Flavin will present Donald Judd's role as a critic in the 60s and 70s through the lens of the Jewish Museum's current exhibition, New York, 1962 to 1964, which includes many of the artists he reviewed during that time. And Joanna and Wayne will share their current roles as performers, performers artists, writers, creative producers who are also critics in this present day. Flavin, thank you so much for beginning our program. I give you the floor. Thanks. Um, hi. Um, I, I think I have more questions than um, statements. Um, if you read Don's uh, reviews of the time uh, of this show, um, it's clear that he's he's uh, working out what he thinks uh, via uh, observing other people's works and what they're doing. Um, prior to getting the job as uh, an art critic uh, for Arts Magazine, he was um, teaching shop. So it was actually a big step up, um, shop in history at a private school. Um, but obviously it was a way for him to spend more time thinking about what he wanted to, wanted to think about, which was art. Um, his paintings at the time of the early to mid 60s are very transitory and show him struggling to figure out what he wants to do. 
Um, and he starts out, starts the period with some very kind of um, messy uh, geometric patterns based on, on the visible world, like bridges and trees and buildings, and winds up with thin curved lines on flat planes. Um, and from there moves to straight lines. Um, and his reviews um, contain uh, a lot of, of what he's interested in. So for instance, he really likes uh, Jack Wesley's work because it's flat, same with Lichtenstein. Um, he likes Oldenburg for the radicality. He's really interest, interested in Bontecu for her, her physicality and radicality. Um, and he has lots of um, undisguised um, disinterest in a lot of the other uh, works of the time. But I think that's also because uh, if you're seeing, I don't know, what it was at 15 to 30 shows a month, you get very uh, aware of, you become very aware of what's going on and what people are doing and how what they're doing has been done before. And for him, that's, uh, that's something to be avoided. Um, I don't know um, how much Don would be um, typical as, as uh, an artist working as a critic. Certainly his cohort at Arts Magazine, Sidney Tillum, was also an artist. Um, so at the time, it couldn't have been that rare. Um, but clearly there were art, there were critics who were just critics and were not practicing artists. So I don't know how that's different now. Um, and clearly the, the, the manner of writing is different. I mean, Don's writing is different from Sidney Tillum's and, and the other people of the time, um, just as it's you know, probably different from, you know, very different from now. Um, and um, he makes, you know, um, he makes, he's not disguising the fact that he has preferences uh, in one way or another. And as I think, <laughs> I think as he narrows his uh, art, own art down to what he wants to do, uh, possibly also his uh, uh, patience with what other people are doing uh, lessons. Um, but that's not something that I've, you know, that's, that's for somebody's PhD to figure out. I haven't done it, done the research. Um, and um, he stops writing around uh, 65, even though he had his first uh, one person show in 63 at Green at Green Gallery, um, which was work that he he finally thought was, uh, um, I don't know, developed enough to show prior. He didn't want to show the paintings that he had, he had done before, um, but he still reviewed a bit after uh, his one person show. Um, and then, as might be known, he also kept writing. Um, up till the very end, uh, but not reviews of other people's work. So that's what I have to say. I wanted to thank the Jewish Museum for inviting me um, and say it's it's strange and it's also really fun to be asked to um, talk about Donald Judd. And I actually um, wrote a piece for this great, book that came out, I guess, in 2021, uh, Donald Judd Artworks 1970-1994, and I wrote about his um, practice of art criticism, and so I thought I would read just some short snippets from that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm skipping around, so this isn't, you know, how the essay uh, flows exactly. Um, many decades after him, I work essentially the same beat as Donald Judd. In the 1974 introduction to his complete writings, 1959 to 1975, he remarked of his day job, 15 reviews a month seems to be the average. I write between 9 and 14. 
Um, it's apples and oranges, of course. He lived in a different New York. He wrote of an art world that's alien to me, but the institution and the task of the short gallery review does not seem to have changed much in the intervening years. <clears throat> Even if by my standards, Judge, Judd engaged in breathtaking critical malpractice at times, producing reviews that I find self-serving, those in which art is, is excitedly portrayed as a narrow ranked field, a tight race between a handful of late modernist American men or outlandishly wrong, dismissive pieces on Legia Clark or Nikki de St. Paul, for example, I still see him as a comrade. I understand the demands of the unforgiving form. And then um, I skip a little bit to talk about his style. Um, his Spartan rigor can sometimes come off as robotic and fed up, an unexpectedly scintillating combination of qual qualities in a review. Other times, the effect of his syntax is pleasantly hypnagogic as well as freeing. He offers a vision of writing, of writing about art particularly, as an untortured process, an unfussy enumeration of fact and opinion assembled without the clutter of equivocation in a row on the page. So I think that speaking to what Flavin mentioned, we're, we're talking about someone who is very invested in contemporary art as at the time as an artist. And so it makes sense that there would be um, a set of concerns and something of an agenda, which to me is sort of, you know, writing in 2022, 20, I don't think, well, I shouldn't say I wouldn't be permitted to do it, but um, it's just things have changed so much. The art world is so much bigger. Um, seeing from the, the quantity of reviews that Jeb was writing, it really does seem like he kind of saw everything in the galleries. And I spend, you know, probably to almost full days a week seeing art and I don't, don't see everything, like not even close. There's so much to see. And skipping ahead to, or not ahead, but to the, to the present, um, seeing the show at the Jewish Museum, New York, 1962 to 1964, I think of it as, such a beautiful corrective in a way to what I was criticizing in my essay, this notion of art as a narrow ranked field, um, because it really explodes the notion of culture and visual culture and sort of the, um, the kind of art that Jed was most interested in is just one thing, you know? Um, he has a beautiful piece in the show. There's a Kenneth Nolan, a Stella, but it's, it's in this kind of um, wonderful crowd of material that um, I think it's a, it's a kind of desegregation of the moment. And I mean that in the sense, not only of, you know, it was a very, white art world and this show puts not only brings more of a diverse group of artists together than was than would have been in a group show in 1962 most likely um i think that it's become clear that the way to make art work as a more inclusive, welcoming, interesting field is not just to find individual artists to put in the canon or put in conversation with each other, but to actually expand what matters about art. And so having these sort of abbreviated period rooms, I mean, having a kitchen in the show, I think is very profound. It's, a, it's an alien sphere. Um, but of course it's so important. I mean, a kitchen is 
a kitchen is life and it's creative and it it's the kind of thing that um, helps all of these disparate objects and paintings and and images uh, really cohere. Um, and then I, I also wanted to talk about, um, in terms of Donald, Donald Judd, but also, well, actually more just about art criticism and the way that we comment on the art of our time as, as reviewers, those of us who are reviewers. Um, I read this, I've been reading this book by Ben Davis called Art in the Afterculture. And um, he has a chapter called Art in Ecotopia, uh, and which he begins by quoting Bill McKibben, who is an author, activist, environmentalist. Um, so McKibben says, here's the paradox. If the scientists are right, we're living through the biggest thing that's happened since human civilization emerged. One species, ours, has by itself in the course of a couple of generations managed to powerfully raise the temperature of an entire planet to knock its most basic systems out of kilter. But oddly, though we know about it, we don't know about it. It hasn't registered in our gut. It isn't part of our culture. Where are the books, the poems, the plays, the operas? Um, I mean, when people someday look back on our moment, the single most significant item will doubtlessly be the sudden spiking temperature, but they'll have a hell of a time figuring out what it meant to us. And I've been sort of haunted by this. Like, yeah, that's, that's true. Like in 50 years, people will look at, you know, the goings on about town section of the New Yorker. I mean, I can hope they will, I guess, but, um, and it'll seem just like, what are these people fucking talking about, you know? Um, and I started really seeing art differently. It's been gradual, but I think that this summer I had sort of a powerful experience at the, um, at the Becker's, Hilla and Bern Becker uh, exhibition. And you know, it's this 60s, 70s and beyond photography of um, these, you know, coal, coal, what are they called? Um, well, anyway, these, these amazing architectural things and, and they're, documenting this industry at a time when it's already kind of, these things are becoming obsolete. Um, but they were really embraced by, by minimalists in the, in the United States. And the exhibition was really about the formal qualities of these photographs. And I was like, I, I can only see this as the end. You know, I don't, I can't really see this as grids, um, in industry, seriality, it looks like the end of the world. It looks like these aliens, these robots have descended and they're destroying the earth. And I think, I think that like maybe we're starting or I'm starting to shift where I'm not, I, I'm starting to see things as like, I mean, we could talk about Clement Greenberg, but he's starting to become a footnote, right? Um, and this time period is really gonna be seen differently. Um, I don't even think we're gonna have to wait 50 years, but I think that all of, all of this work will be seen in the context of um, you know, our spiking temperature. So I know that's a, a real digression, but... <laughs> Um, I was also going to talk about Lee Bontecu, but let's maybe, maybe we should just save that for the conversation part. Thank you, Flavin. And 
Johanna and Sarah and everyone at the Jewish Museum and Jenna for making all this happen. I'm going to say a few words about my practice as a writer around, behind, beyond, within, below art. Not exactly a writer about art, but an, a writer next to art, adjacent to art, happy to be an art's shadow, etc. And And then I want to show a short video I've made that functions as a form of art writing. So I I don't consider myself an art critic. I, I, I'm a writer of poetry, fiction, and essays, and my writing stands next to visual art frequently because why shouldn't it? Visual art is the most appealing thing around. So I've longed to stand next to visual art in my writing, to absorb its glow, to learn from its allure, and to give myself some of the freedoms that artists in the last 50, 100 years have taken, and that this show at the Jewish Museum uh, represents a kind of crucible moment of the taking of these freedoms, the relishing of these freedoms. My influences, as a writer in general, but particularly as a writer next to art, are Gertrude Stein, Mallarmé, James Schuyler, uh, Genet, whose essay, What Remains of a Rembrandt, torn into little squares all the same size and shot down the toilet, is my favorite piece of art writing ever written. Uh, Roland Barthes, whose essay, The Third Meaning, on the poetics of the film still, is to me the most important thing he wrote, and the one that is with me, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the essay that is with me every day as I look at art, seeking to find the third meaning of art. And so what the question would be then, what's the third meaning of the Jewish Museum show? And I guess it's spiking temperature. The third meaning of all of us here is spiking temperature. Uh, I started writing about art in 19, or started writing about or near to art in 1993 when Christian Markley, a young Christian Markley, asked a young Wayne to write about a series of his uh, assemblages or sculptures called masks. And I've continued to write near art ever since. My subjects or comrades have included Glenn Ligon, Amy Silman, Matt Connors, Karen Kalimnik, Lisa Mexen, Forrest Bess, The Dead and the Living. The three most recent essays I've written near art are concerned with Polly Apfelbaum, Walter Walter Pfeiffer, and Alex Katz. For Apfelbaum, I wrote a poem for a catalog. For, for, uh, for Pfeiffer, I wrote a playlet with his permission. I had written a playlet for Karen Kalimnik and it didn't end up being in the catalog because I had not sought permission first. I always ask now. And for uh, Alex Katz, I wrote more of a standard essay, though I dictated the essay into my phone as I was in the Alex Katz studio looking at the collages about which I wrote. So in a way it is a, I, I can, it, it was a, in a way, a performance of my responses to the cat's works while I was there, then transcribed and rearranged uh, formally. So for each piece I write about or near art, I always set up a procedure. I think for an essay I once wrote about some Glenn Ligon portraits, self-portraits, oblique self-portraits, series called Figure, I made a list of uh, words or kinds of terms that I would include in this piece, which therefore, I think the word tsunami was one of the things I said it has to, maybe I said it has to include, this piece has to include a reference to a natural catastrophe. And so there that when it, you know, and it's not because the essay becomes better because it includes a tsunami, but it, I can think it's a poet's way of proceeding, perhaps. I can think more acutely if I know what my verbal destinations will be. I'm more, this is, I think, a temperamental thing about me and not necessarily a thing about the critic today, is I become a, a more useful writer when I am paying the most fastidious attention to the behavior of my words, not when I am 
pursuing an argument. The arguments will take care of themselves, my, at least within my precincts. Uh, I began painting in 2010 and have been doing it very uh, avidly ever since. Uh, the fear, of course, is the, the, the hobbyists. The, the fear of being an amateur has never stopped me in anything, including writing about or near art. I'm an amateur at that as I'm an amateur at painting, but I'm a passionate amateur and I have learned from the materials of painting how to write more carefully and more artfully. I've gained a much greater respect for the materiality of syntax and of words because of my experience as a painter understanding that painting is primarily acts of judicious and spontaneous, often spontaneous, but procedurally governed uh, acts of responsiveness to the facts of paint and of supports. And these facts are mutating and one can, mute, one can do many things with even the decision to paint is already begging the question of why choose my zone of responses to be it, having to do with supports and, and conventionally made paints. Uh, but those are other questions to be dealt with in different panels, maybe Jewish museum panels, always happy to be on a Jewish museum panel. Uh, I will close by saying that in the last three or four years, I've been made most happy as a creative individual and as an essayist by making very, very brief uh, film essays or essay films or essay videos that are, you could say they're performance art or you could say many things about them. But one thing I will say today about them is that they're works of uh, art commentary. And I wanna show two of them that, that, that respond to, that, re, that in which I'm working as a media critic and as an art critic. The first is called Peter's Pyrite Radio, and it's about a studio visit I made to my friend Peter Semensky as he showed me his work. And the second is called Sensitive Material, and this responds to some uh, found footage from talk shows of the 1970s. And I should say that these are new media works to the extent that their primary destination is, is and, and field of dissemination is Instagram, though of course I have larger ambitions for them. But I'm also very happy with their promiscuous and degraded uh, travel across my limited universe on these benighted, uh, capital shadowed, capital stained forms of uh, social Congress. Maybe that's my response, Joanna, to the it, to how how uh, the spiking temperature infiltrates my work is the kind of benign, anesthetized but giddy accept my benign and giddy and anesthetized acceptance of the 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 world the surveillance capitalism's control of me and my my happy avid participation as a unpaid laborer within the field of social media capitalism i don't know how that connects i could connect that at another time with spiking temperature but i guess it's the combination of collaboration and anesthesia and in a way, which is, I, I think, that Warhol's particular cocktail of uh, pleasure and anhedonia explains something about our relation to spiking temperature and to media capitalism. I think Warhol gave us a model for that, that zone between acute feeling and the absence of feeling. Okay, so here are the videos. I'm going to. It's fun. That's more distorted, but 
Versus like the songs that we were listening to before. Person. I'm quite a shy person, and in, the, in this particular kind of scenes, I would like to be alone. Mm -hmm. Even though I know Marcello for 20 years, I've known him. There are a lot of feelings involved in it. Just It's not just love, just by making love. There are a lot of feelings involved in it. And you needed a lot of concentration to do a scene like that. Very sensitive. Mm. There's that word again. I. Um, and we can uh, jump into a conversation. First, I just thank you each for sharing. And there's a through line that I noticed and wanted to address as a first question. And it was about kind of the prolific multifarious nature of, of not only Judd, but also you, Joanna and Wayne, your um, writings and reviews and what you cover. And I'm, you know, having read a number of, of Judd's reviews and also a number of your writings and reviews, I'm con I found myself asking myself, what are the limits or the expectations you set for yourself in terms of, um, you know, as writers? How do, you, how do you balance what you're writing about others, including other critics writing reviews of, of, of books of criticism or of exhibitions or artists or of opera singers? How do you balance your prolific writings with your own creative practice and your own creative production? I mean, I, I'll just say one thing quickly that there is, I think that within the genres and, and uh, that we, we, within the zones that literature has to behave, that words have to behave within the social space of the review and other spaces of writing around art, including the catalog essay, the monograph, the poem, they're very, they're, the adjudication procedures are very different in each. And that generally I don't, I've written very few, if any, art reviews. I've written book reviews, but I don't really like writing book reviews. I have more or less abstained from the task of evaluation in my writing. And I, I'm not denying that there is a social function for this kind, for a kind of gatekeeping adjudication, but that's not my function in my writing. And it, I, it's all economic to some extent. That is not, I, since because I have an academic job, even though I'm not an academic, I don't make a, a living from writing reviews or I do not, that's not a zone for me of economic necessity. And that's a, a fact. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, thank you, Wayne, for sharing your videos. And I think that we can refer to those as sort of a model of, um, 
a way of reporting on art that isn't about evaluating it really. And I, I don't, I try not to think of what I do as evaluating art. And I guess what I usually think is I've, my evaluation happens before I even come to the page. Like it's what I write about. Um, and that's like compromised obviously because I am assigned um, things, particularly for the New Yorker, there's kind of like an expectation about what is significant and what will be covered by the magazine. But um, I, I'm able to also, I think, write about things that you know, other writers probably wouldn't choose. And so that's my, that's my way of saying this is not even that this is good, but this is like, this is contributing something and I want you to know about it. Um, so, and then I, I just, to go back to the question, how do I balance it with my creative work? I mean, I do not balance it. Like there's no balance in my life. <laughs> like it's, it's like how to, you know, I guess, um, not fall over. It's like, you just are falling over, but until you hit the ground, you haven't completely fallen over. That doesn't make sense, but you know what I'm saying? There's no balance and it's a real struggle to um, pursue other writing um, and other anything really creative. But I also, when I really feel down about that, I try to think, okay, well, this is art, you know, the review can be art and like, let me try to push it a little bit. Like, how can I be a little bit more me? How can I like make this a little bit surprising or say what I, I would secretly want to say and I sort of try to sneak it in there or I just say it, of course, you know, um, in the, in reviews, I mean, I get to be a little bit more expansive and uh, associative in, in other kinds of pieces that I write, like the longer articles, um, the, the very short form reviews, you know, the, the kind of like 130 word length, you know, it's, it's rough. <laughs> Can I, can I just add one kind of qualifier or, or not a retraction exactly, but I, I, I say that I don't, in any, I, I so acknowledge and revere the space of the review when taken on by a writer who understands the, in a way, the, the gorgeous torture that those limits can be. And that, I mean, just to take the example of James Schuyler, who's, short reviews for art news are as beautiful as any of his poems. They're exercises in description. Yeah. And I revere that kind of writing that maybe sneaks into the culture in the pages. You know, it's it's not in the in the poetry, it's not on the poetry page. It's in the reviews page, but it's a poem. Mm -hmm. And I love that subterfuge. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that makes me think of your writing on Jesse Norman in Art Forum in 2020, which at the end of that, I thought you, it was a sculpture in words. It was a presence you created of your descriptions of her, of her in an auditory fashion and in a, you know, clothing textile fashion, you reconstituted her in a way. It was a sculpture. It was, it was a performance on your part that was every bit, you know, an artist making as a three-dimensional expression. And so when I ask, like, how, what are the limits or what are the expectations you each have um, for your expression, whether it be art adjacent or a, a, a critical review or just a review that's, you know, presenting a response, it's because you're each cultural producers of your own 
you're not strict critics writing for Art Forum or, you know, um, The New Yorker or anywhere else. You're, you're, does it feed you? Does it feed your own practices? Or, you know, is it just this flux, this flow between all of these categories of your life? Well, I would say that writing reviews and having writing that I do once a week or what, you know, these different deadlines has made me um, break out of my perfectionist um, cycles. So, um, and I've become less self-sabotaging because I have like this homework that I do and I can feel like I did my homework, you know, <laughs> I don't know. There's something, um, uh, there's something that gives my life structure and like keeps me moving about writing these pieces. But then on the deeper level, you know, I, when I write a review, I don't think, I do think about the artist reading it and not because I like want to make them happy or say that they're wonderful. I mean, sometimes I do think they're wonderful, but it's not about their feelings. It's about like, I don't want anyone to read it and say, oh, she didn't even think about it or, you know, she didn't even notice anything or, she, you know, so I, I want to be really thoughtful and I want to um, approach it with integrity and with the kind of sort of, I don't know, spiritual is the word. I guess it's spiritual, like just to really acknowledge that even when art is pretty bad, like it really took a lot to put it into the world and it really means something to the artist. Um, I mean, I suppose there's exceptions to that and there's people who like are putting stupid stuff out and they're not even serious, but basically I consider it, you know, sort of a deep vulnerability um, to, to, ex to create something and to share it. So I try not to like step on that and, um, or, or show a lack of respect. Um, and I don't, I don't write many negative reviews for that reason, maybe, but I, I, I do think that I am critical and I do think that I am constantly learning from the art that I look at. Like in that way, I'm completely live the most charmed life that, you know, that it's my job to pay attention to things that people put into the world with love and passion and you know so um yes it does feed my creative work <laughs> i get I, I love that answer joanna and i would say my answer is very parallel in a sense is that i i i love the homework of writing for occasions and that i if i i, I entered writing in my late teens, early 20s, wanting to be a fiction writer and then a poet and having a very pure and remote notion of what that meant. And then I encountered the world and its economic issues, you know, I mean, of just how do you get through the world and you, and then how, and writing then forms a tool in one's negotiation with the necessities of life. And then of course, I, there's a period of deep gratitude that there are occasions and financial rewards, however meager, connected to my words. And then the, the next question becomes, how can I uh, somehow align those necessary occasions with some of the more misbehaving impulses that I entered writing the writing world in the first place to practice. And then it becomes a lifelong series of compromises and dances between forms of responsibility to the world and to audience and to occasion and the imperatives of 
my voice as if there were such a, an unadulterated thing. And I, it's funny, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moved, Sarah, that you uh, referred so kindly to my Jesse Norman piece, because I would consider, I, there I was extremely aware that it was, I'm writing about a great artist who's just passed away. I'm writing for a magazine art form that will have very knowing and critical readers, uh, very apprised of contemporary debates and of issues and aesthetics. And so I, you know, I, it's not that I would ever just publish a journal entry or something like that. I was aware of forms of responsibility of address. I did, I wrote the piece though, the way I wrote pieces in that kind of pre-pandemic, mid-pandemic till now way by dictating them. I don't know why, but I, I felt the Jesse Norman piece, I just thought, well, I can't cope with the grandeur of this assignment. I'm terrified. How can I salute Jesse Norman? Who am I to do this? So, so I have to start in it with a form of nearness to muteness by just like crawling out of bed as it were and just saying, Jesse Norman. And, and, and things, you know, and, and begin there, then transcribe it, then sculpt it and make it real. But I guess that crawling, crawling out of the muck of the inarticulacy, because there is an occasion to which I must respond, that's a dialectic that will always exist, even though I grandly say I don't write reviews. Of course I do. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm gonna to jump to a completely different topic now and one focused on exhibition projects and, and the task of, of critics and response. Um, since 2015 or 2016, the Judd Foundation has hosted exhibitions of select artists that Donald Judd reviewed in the 60s, um, including artists represented in the current exhibition at the Jewish Museum, New York, 1962 to 1964. And those projects have included a James Rosenquist exhibition, Flavin, that you, you coordinated in 2016 while Jim was still living. So we've worked together briefly on that. Um, but Flavin, I'm curious, how have these exhibition projects successfully highlighted for you and for the foundation and engaged Judd's role as a critic and an artist at that time? And what have you learned along the way? That's the first part of my question. The second part will be for Joanna and Wayne. Uh, that's a big question. I, well, the Rosenquist show came about because it's something that Don and I had talked about. Um, so specifically that, that had a impulse from Don, uh, even though we had talked about Rosenquist and Marfa. Um, and then I was, I just always really loved the Rosenquist paintings and thought they are actually still quite radical for, you know, being 60 years old or something. Um, uh, I don't, I just thought it looked really good. I don't know what I learned. I can't, I don't relate it to the reviews. I don't relate it really to what was happening then. Um, obviously the work that we showed wasn't, was, was uh, some of it was done later. So it's not what Don saw. So it's not, it's not a direct correlation. Um, I was just happy to do it and happy that Jim liked to do it and happy that it looked good and hopefully somebody found something useful from it, whether it's a writer, an artist, or a curator, you know, I don't know. Um, um, it's, you're producing an experience and, uh, um, we're not, I'm not saying what that experience should be or anything. I'm just saying, throwing it up and saying, let's look at this. Um, and then also we did a Kusama show, which I, I mean, I, I talked to Don about Kusama, but we never said, oh, there should be a show. So that was more about doing something actually more related to what he would have seen because I asked her to do, to, um, to show net paintings only. Um, so no pumpkins or anything. Um, and fortunately, I mean, she, I mean, she was, she was okay with that. I mean, there's, there's, you never know. Um, 
and again, I, I, I don't read the, I haven't read the summer review in years. So I wasn't going off of what Don said. And, uh, and in fact, Don's reviews are almost all superseded for the people he liked. They're all superseded by conversations that I had later with him. So um, while I learned something from his reviews of the time, um, I learn about more about the time and not and less about what he thought or the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, again, it's uh, the impulse was it would be nice to X. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's as far as I get in, in trying to do these things. I think the excitement and the radical nature of bringing other artists into the ground floor of Spring Street location of the foundation um, is just that it was a bit radical. And for us, for you know the Rosenquist Foundation and, and the estate, it was exciting for Jim to have the opportunity to be shown there. And for all these projects, people walking along Spring Street, unexpectedly seeing artists other than what they anticipate in the space was a great opportunity. And so I thought, well, that was kind of a fascinating touchstone to use the fact that as I understood it at the time, Judd had reviewed these artists. So he had a relationship on some level with them, was working not directly with them, but knew them. Um, so he's gonna bring in artists working contemporaneous with him, many of whom, you know, still alive, still working. And, and I appreciated that. I thought that was great. Um, and then Joanna and Wayne, pushing that question a little bit further in your direction, in what ways has your, you know, art and cultural reviews and writing created new or unexpected engagements with artists, writers, singers, other cultural producers, um, new engagement, exhibitions, projects, whatever. How do you hope it, it will, if it hasn't, create new and unexpected engagement? I think that, um... I think Wayne is going to have a more interesting answer. <laughs> you overestimate me, Joy. <laughs> maybe I didn't ask this question of, very well. No, but, no, no, you did. I could, I can. Do, did you want to say something more, Sarah? No, just thinking. You know, like an artwork goes out into the world and has a life beyond its its creator, a life beyond mm -hmm. the artist. And the same with your writings; they have and what you produce and your performances and your creative aspects, these have a life beyond um, your intent. What do you hope that life to be? Or what are some surprising responses that you've already experienced? I guess I would say that the fact that I have a relationship as writer to art at all is the surprise. And that the fact that in 1993, Christian Markley, through a mutual friend, contacted me and said, you, I've heard you're writing a book about voice. I have these pieces that have to do with LP covers. Do you want to write an essay about me? And I didn't really know very much about contemporary art at all. And then I said, yeah, I did it. And then Artform asked me to write something like to just to choose that my opera book came out and then art form contacted me and said, do you want to write about like your favorite, a, a work of art that changed you? So I wrote about Jasper Johns's In Memory of My Feelings, remembering having seen it in a 1977 retrospective when I was in college at the Whitney, I think at the Whitney. And so these were just like solidly within, there I was in my nerdy academic writer life, poet life, art was sort of interested in me. They were flirting with me, like, oh, you seem art adjacent enough. I want your words. And then that continued to happen. And so I started, I educated myself more about contemporary art gleefully. And I moved to New York, to Chelsea, where I now physically am. And the, there started to be art galleries around here in the, in like 97, I moved here, but they were already here before, but they kept on coming. And so that it became a natural part of the fabric of my daily life to be in conversation with curators, people who ran galleries and artists. And I always was so happy that artists liked my words about them and wanted me to visit their studios. It seemed like just, I was so flattered and titillated by this 
by my sudden access to their methods, just to be in a studio. And then I was asked to be a visiting critic as right, poets who are adjacent to art often are. And so I was always in artist studios and I would wonder, well, I know I love Frank O'Hara and he did this, but why precisely am I as a poet always in artist studios? And I mean, so I guess the thing that has happened in the world because of my writing is that I have ended up in the company of artists and I find that company just deliriously satisfying. And the fact that later I became a painter by osmosis from all these studio visits is a kind of after dinner drink treat. It was never the mission. I was never taking notes, but I will say having now become a painter, I chide my earlier self for its lack of attentiveness to the materials of art. I wrote a whole biography of, or a tiny biography of Andy Warhol, and I never really paid attention to the what silk screening actually was. I had a, I had a, a an, an intellectual understanding of it that passed muster, but I didn't. Had I ever actually witnessed an act of dragging? You know, I didn't really know, and and whatever. So I I have learned to care much more about the techniques of art making and the. Ex expressivity and weirdness of its materials. I, um, well, I went to art school and I was a painter. Um, and I think that, you know, when I talk to students, as I do sometimes, like I visit classes, it's like, I feel sort of like, I don't know what to tell you about how to become an art writer because basically what happened is I went to art school. I had, I had jobs. I worked for um, Pat Hearn, who um, was, a, was a gallerist and Mary Heilman, who was then at Showing with Pat. Um, I was her studio assistant. I worked for Billy Sullivan. I had, so I was in, I was, was like a assistant, you know, for these people. So that was kind of my graduate school. And then I was in a band and I just totally left it all behind in a way like those jobs. Well, I worked for, I also worked at this space called Thread Waxing Space, um, which was an alternative art space in uh, Soho. I think I just, in a way, was starting to get angry at, at artists because I would be like, well, I'm a really good artist. <laughs> so, so why am I printing your checklist? And why am I, you know, and so, which is like just a kind of young person way to be. But then I was in a band and I just left it all behind. And I, it, that allowed me to like, not feel resentful or competitive you know, with visual artists who are successful or, you know, doing things. Um, but kind of randomly someone, uh, my friend who was an editor at Book Forum asked me to review a um, book about music and I wrote it and people were like, you did such a great job and didn't you go to art school? And then people at Art Forum asked me to write. And then it was just like, I, people just kept asking me to write things. And I think a little bit like Wayne, it's like art is great in this, or the art world is great. And like, they don't really love experts that much. You know what I mean? There's like the academic writing, there's the PhDs, the graduate school people, but artists don't really love reading that stuff about their work generally. Do you know what I mean? They want an emotional response. They want someone who has a sense of wonder about it, who's curious about it, who is actually like, I don't know, you know, what this means. You know, they like that kind of um, dilett not dilettantish, but yet yeah, amateurish in the right way. And the like, I'm down for whatever. Let's see what this art's about. Um, so I think that that's probably Wayne and I share that kind of like that's our art criticism superpower it's like we never tried to be art critics and 
in that way, there was room for something more exciting and flexible to emerge. Can I just say, so you were at, you were at Pat Hearn. It just, that means so much to me to hear that, Joanna, because that was it's such, that gallery was so important to me when I moved to New York. And particularly, and I've written about this, particularly uh, one show among many, but the Jimmy DeSana show that was like in 97, maybe, or 98. That was just, I don't know if you were working there then, but that's when I met Daniel Reich, who was part of, for me in those years, exactly my, who he represented my interface with art. And when he had a, you know, visiting always kind of following Daniel's lead and being and being grateful for his gratitude for my words and my opinions, but just to just a salute to Pat Hearn and the gallery and to you there. Thank you. I what you know, I worked at Pat's apartment. Um and I worked really closely with Daniel, but um well, as you know, Pat became quite sick and so wasn't always going to the gallery. So I would be with her um, more at the apartment and just go back and forth between the apartment and gallery with the transparencies and the stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, Daniel, well, a very special person. Um, who I learned a lot from and whose passion was contagious. I think that that was a really, uh, you know, I'm glad we're talking about him. I think he was a really formative energy. Mm -hmm. and, and also, but just that the space of what we'll call it amateurism or in the best sense or passion or the relishing of contiguity that they're, they're around the block, I'm here. There's Daniel starting a gallery in his apartment. It, the, the sense of genuine discovery rather than, oh, I heard that Jimmy DeSana was important. I'm going to go research him. Just discovery and that there are people who want to have conversations with you about this. And the fact that we seem to have words at our disposal makes us interesting to these people. <laughs> And that's that becomes exciting and it becomes an exchange where there's a happy reciprocity. Yeah, I agree. Joanna, you mentioned, um, I think it was Rosenberg, you mentioned perhaps being a footnote at this point and, and maybe what's happening now will perhaps be something of a footnote in the future in fewer than 50 years. I'm going to get to the juxt of this panel's premise, um, which you know the Jewish Museum and the Judd Foundation co-organized for us, and that is ultimately how has the task of the critic. If we're looking at Rosenberg and Greenberg's role in the at mid-century and beyond, and then Donald Judd's engagement as an artist and critic in the '60s and '70s, and now your experience as writers dealing with the arts now, how has that role? change from your predecessors? What is the task now versus then? And, and what are you relating to or reacting against in your, you know, with your predecessors? I'll just very brief answer, Joanna, kind of to picking up from some your thing about the spike in climate. I, I, I think the task of the art critic or whatever, somebody writing about art is just this necessity of bringing art into its already there alignment with the larger urgent uh, exigencies of the world. I mean, that's a very grand way of putting it, but as opposed to Clement Greenberg, not that he wasn't doing his part as he could do it then, but that our just understanding of arts imbrication with the world at large and arts responsiveness and responsibility to that world is something that's always in the mind of somebody writing near art, I think. Attending to the third meaning of the tsunami. Yeah. I mean, I think that earlier in my life, um, I might have thought that the, 
that in, in terms of like, just to go back to that, I think I said uh, that Greek, uh, Clement Greenberg will feel more like a footnote than like the such a defining voice of the time. Um, I think that I felt earlier in in my writing career, but also just in my life that I was part of bringing the footnotes into the center and um, and sort of you know decentering those voices that way by um, you know, like how great that like Rosalind Drexler had this amazing moment in the show, how great that like Melvin Edwards is in there and you can see the relationship between those Lynch fragments and the John Chamberlain pieces. Like these are really important things that we still should be doing and I still wanna do. But I also really wanna timestamp my work so that I like to talk about like what's in the news right now when I'm looking at something because, um, you know, when I read the Bill McKibben quote, I, I don't necessarily agree with him. Like, I think there are songs and poems and paintings and operas about climate change, about the spiking temperature. We don't necessarily see them for what they are yet. But um, these are the responses to this moment. Um, there's like unconscious intentions. There's in intentions that people haven't um, interpreted or perceived yet about contemporary art. And I had a you know that moment I had with the Beckers. Like I'm having more moments like that when I like when I saw the Lee Bonteque. I've always said Lee Bonteku, but maybe it's Bonteku. Anyway, um, so I saw her incredible piece in the show and um, was just, I mean, I know her work from, you know, but I just was like really floored by it, seeing it the other day and thought about, you know, and I came home and then I read, I looked up what Donald Judd wrote about her and you know, for all my criticism of his approach to art writing, like he wrote so beautifully about her work. And the, I, I see, and he obviously had a very profound response to her work and it was how I feel. I would have, you know, she said that she was in some of her prints, she was depicting in these abstractions, war machines. And, um, you know, in your work in, as she grew up during World War II. And so in her work, you can see these like volcanic things or these craters or these images of like despair and the void. Um, so I don't really know what my point is, but that um, these things, like, what do they mean now? And what can, I feel like she was a little bit, the discourse wasn't about, at that time, people weren't saying, these are the most powerful representations of World War II I've seen. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was written about in terms of abstraction. Um, but, it doesn't have to be, you know, written about that way now. And when I thought about that, and then I saw work that's sort of more aloof, um, like the Stella or the um, Kenneth Nolan, you know, I wondered, okay, so will this come across in a, in a decade or so as maybe ironic? Like, will this sort of positive image of industry or of these kinds of, um, I don't know. I, I, I thought that it might just play really differently in the future when people are thinking about this work being made at like the beginning of the end, you know?
Can I add, can I add something or a response, Joanna, about time stamping, how important that is and how I, I really salute this exhibit at the Jewish Museum for doing such a good job of time stamping and to give just two examples, like the Lee Bontecu example that you gave, Joanna. Uh, one thing, the, I noticed that the wall text for Kenneth Nolan's painting acknowledged that he learned that technique from Helen Frankenthaler. Clement Greenberg, the footnote that we described earlier, it, you know, was it, as far as I know from books like Ninth Street Women, was responsible for this kind of partial eclipse of Frankenthaler's originary role in color field painting. And so that the, the precision of this show is that even in its wall text, which I usually don't want wall text, but in this case, it was act, it, it was a you know, correcting the historical record in a very important way. Similarly, I've just been reading, just finished reading the day before I arrived at the Jewish Museum, Carolee Schneeman's correspondence course, a collection of her, of her letters. And it, it's her task for her, much of her creative life was correcting the historical record about her role in Flux's performance art, feminist art, body art, just like, you know, having to her the constant ways that she found her own contributions misrecognized. And so I was, of course, grateful to see her work there as well. And also grateful to see that one of the two little things shown was a still from a perform from a performance she directed, not where she was nude in, but a performance she directed with Yvonne Rayner as a cast member, because it's also in the Carolee Schneeman correspondence course, you see that right away that that Carolee resented the fact that right that her role as director or artificer of these events was quickly overshadowed by figures like Yvonne Rayner, with due credit given to the greatness of Yvonne Rayner, but that or Stan Brackage or these other figures who, uh, and it's not a question of the theft per se, but it's just inaccuracy and how wounding these inaccuracies are to makers in their own time as they see their works uh, eclipse, not because they're not good enough, but because they haven't entered the historical record with sufficient clout and vigor. And so th I think that was for me, the primary effect, the time stamping that this exhibit did is what, you know, it's not quite like putting a banner saying we are at the end of the world now and we're looking back to 1962, but one kind of housekeeping we can do at the present is just be accurate about what's happened, what's happening right now, what's happened recently. I agree, I think it was very gracefully done the way they recuperated certain artists that had been eclipsed as you so well put it, um, whether in a wall label or in other formats, it was simple, straightforward and it, beyond time. And then this leads to my last question gracefully as well. And also speaking of like the spiking temperature and the end of the world theme that's run throughout, uh, when Judd was writing his reviews of many of the artists that are featured in this show, you know, of Lee Bontecu and uh, Yayo Kusama, Oldenburg, Rosenquist, Stella, any number of artists, they were young, they were emerging um, it can't be overstated the significance that early writings and early reviews played in their careers. Now, you know, the arc of their careers for the most part, we're on the other end, um, whether they're still living or, or, or no longer alive. Um, Wayne and Joanna, what do you feel, in t do you feel a sense of responsibility when you're reviewing younger um, artists, be there singers, you know, painters, writers, whatever it is, do you feel a sense of responsibility and do you have a different criterion or sensibility when you're reviewing emerging artists versus people who are, are already established? Are you aware of, of approaching it differently? I mean, I, I write a lot about artists who haven't been written about before. And 
I actually, I guess in a more self-centered way, I find it like fun because I'm not, there's no narrative to disrupt or, you know, consider. I'm just, you know, this is like first generation commentary. There's something exciting about that. When, and, and it wasn't until more recently that I've really written about established artists, even when I wrote about sort of um, important artists in the women's art movement, for example, um, there just hadn't been that much written about them. Um, there were like interviews or there were, you know, group show reviews. So, um, but like, I just wrote about Barbara Kruger for Art Forum. And I was like, fuck, like so many, like there's people have, so many people have written about her. And actually the same with the Donald Judd thing for the catalog. I'm like, what do, you know, you really have to be like, okay, who am I? What do I have to contribute here? Um, because so much has been written. And I guess to go back to what you actually asked, I would, I would just say, I can't, I guess if I really thought about my responsibility, I would just go back to bed and pull the sheets over my head. Um, so I can't really think about the consequences of my writing. I just try to, I just try to do my best, you know? I, I can't think about anyone's career. It's too much, you know? I, I try to not think about careers and I actually don't think about the market, which a lot of my colleagues do and I respect them for it, but I don't go to art fairs and I don't um, look at auctions and stuff like that. I just, there's too much to consider. And so I've just decided not to do that, you know? I, guess, I, th I think because of my academic training in, in literature, not in, in art, and also having come of age in an earlier time, in a way, we're not that earlier, but earlier enough, um, that in a, I, I think in my earlier, in my younger years as writer, I was very aware that the greats were older than me and that there were certain kinds of cultural capital that I could steal by a lot by writing about somebody great and that meant way too much to me when I was younger and I would like to I, I should have just been in a band or something like you Joanna I mean I think I was insufficiently insubordinate in my younger years as a writer we're just always thinking about and too much thinking about the canon too much thinking about who was important and I've kind of swerved away from that quite radically and where I have often an aversion to the the already lauded the the already considered important and I've always had a kind of happy scenting nose for the underdog and see who's hiding and and perhaps a tendency to romanticize the outsider the so-called outsider as a result and I don't mind that that tendency at all but I am aware for example as I as to just to take two pieces I've recently written, the essay on Alex Katz's collages, you know, I certainly didn't take it on myself before I wrote this to read everything that had been written about Alex Katz. And so I approached it in a way, because I was writing about these very early, often unseen works of his, I approached it as if it were in the 1950s and Alex Katz was a promising young artist and here I was in his apartment or whatever, and I was looking at these delicate little collages that he made on his kitchen table. Uh, you know, and, and, but, and then I wrote a piece a couple of years ago for a uh, Lubov Gallery on the Lower East Side, Chinatown, for the uh, friend of mine, a painter Kev Tobin, for his first show. And you know, that happens, you know, he DMs me saying, Wayne, will you write for my show or whatever? Yeah. And it's just on the website. So it's, it's not a very, it's not very important, but it, the thrill there was, I guess, partly the pleasure of anointing somebody, but the pleasure of being able to say exactly what I meant, exactly what I meant, because it was essentially a letter to Kev. And I guess, so that's a, 
I don't, there's no real moral there in any of that, except that saying, let, let's just say, I wish to I wish to not care whether an artist is emerging or deeply lauded. I think that people, you know, I can't always do this because it's considered like, it can be considered a conflict of interest to write about your friends, but I think that when people write about their friends, it's like really some of the best, most profound, wonderful, insightful writing. And I actually, this is something I wanted to say about Donald Judd too, is that he wrote about his friends in a really powerful way. Like I, you can tell that he was a good loyal friend who um, wasn't interested in like bullshitting his friends. There's like a really deep engagement with his contemporaries. And um, I think that's where, I think that's, you know, that's the best, um, for me, that's the, the most sort of meaningful stuff is when he writes about something he really likes um, and gets. And um, I, I'm not really going anywhere with this, except for that I think that friendship is um, sort of underrated or under discussed as like an important lens for art criticism. Um, and that that kind of investment in another person is going to show up as care with with the experience of seeing their work or experiencing their work. So I always tell people like who want to become art writers to write about their friends for that reason, but also because it's silly to like write about Agnes Martin if you're 23 years old. You know what I mean? It's Nancy Prinsenthal did that, like she did it better than you're gonna do it <laughs> at, you know, as a grad student or whatever. So uh, strike out on your own and find, find cool people to hang out with and write about and like go to their studios and, and explain it to me. You know, I wanna know about what you and your friends are doing and I'm not really hanging out with 22 year olds that much anymore. So that's that should be the job of um not to be like ageist or something it's not that older people can't write about young people but I just mean like yeah don't uh, writing about established artists as as a young person I think is not the way to go yeah um, <laughs> let me just add to a bit in the friendship pile that two art critics I really love, or writers near art, Eileen Miles and Dodie Bellamy, yeah. insert really upfront their friendship with the artist that they're writing about by usually just using the first name of the artist, skipping the last name altogether. Well, thank you, each of you, for generously sharing your thoughts and your time with us today. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.